North Africa, 1943. For the American tankers in their first combat mission of the war, it's a baptism of fire. We thought we had the best equipment and everything. We thought we were well prepared. The general said, follow my order, attack. Against the German Africa Corps, it's kill or be killed. Distance 500 meters, tank at 1230, fire at will. Spearheading the German onslaught is Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox. He would say, it is your task to shoot. Shoot, shoot, shoot. The Americans' only hope is General George Patton. We felt if we had a man that had that much guts, well, we had better have some nerve, too. The armies of two of the greatest tank commanders of the Second World War face off turret to turret in the Battle of Tunisia. November 1942. At El Alamein, the British 8th Army deals a devastating blow to Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. His once mighty Africa Corps reduced to just 64 tanks. Their defeat is total, their plight desperate. The shattered remnants of Rommel's forces limp back across the desert. Pursued by the British from the east, they retreat 2,500 kilometers to Tunisia, where they face an allied force advancing across the mountains from the west, including the fledgling US 1st Armored Division. Confident and cocksure in their first combat mission of the Second World War, the Americans come armed with the latest in frontline technology, the Sherman tank. The Allies' newest tank is fast, with a top speed of nearly 40 kilometers per hour, and it's powerful, with a 75 millimeter short-barreled cannon. At El Alamein, it proved itself a winner and in Tunisia, the American tankers are riding high on expectation. We thought we had the best equipment and everything. We thought we were well prepared. I had no fear. The Allies land an impressive initial force of more than 400 tanks, 100 tank destroyers, and 70,000 men. But the American tankers have yet to be tested in the heat of battle and the cauldron of war. For all their bravado, they are rookies still. So we certainly were. We had no actual combat experience. It was a big handicap. For Rommel, the problem is a dire shortage of men and arms. But he's thrown a lifeline when the 5th Panzer Army lands in Tunisia bringing with them powerful anti-tank guns and long-barreled Panzer IVs. In my opinion, it was possibly the best tank in the world at that time, even better than the Sherman. We were under the impression that we were definitely going to be superior to the Americans. By January, the Germans field 300 Panzers, over 100,000 troops, and hundreds of anti-tank guns. The fate of Rommel and his tankers hangs in the balance. Whoever wins here wins North Africa. The battle lines are drawn in the remote mountains of western Tunisia. The Germans attack first, then dig in on either side of the Fayyid Pass, where they wait for the Americans to launch a counterattack, which they do on January 31st. 
Their plan, to engage the enemy in open combat. The general said, follow my orders, attack. I had a lieutenant as my commander of the tank. Actually, he wanted to get more bars or something, and he says, I'll go first. You know, so, so I was a driver, so we went out. You could see the Americans attacking from the front. We were just heading forward. We didn't know where the enemy was or anything. I don't want to bash the Americans, but in my opinion, they were inexperienced. In my opinion, they were inexperienced. Our 88 guns were camouflaged well in the cactus core. They entice you to come through. And the Americans didn't see it. And then they opened fire on us. And the Americans didn't stand a chance against the 88 anyway. The German 88 is the most lethal weapon on the battlefield. It has a 4.9 meter barrel and a muzzle velocity of 820 meters a second. With a clear line of view, it can destroy a Sherman at a range of more than two kilometers. If the 88 was positioned right and camouflaged well, it was able to bring down tanks that were very far away. The only way we can outdo them is face them head on. But if they get you from the side, uh, we are very vulnerable. Well, sometimes you don't even know where they were coming from. You know, when shell fire hits, it's loud. Oh, it could be... 10 feet away. When I looked out there, it was like I could get out there and get a baseball bat and hit those things. One of our tanks in our company, his 75 millimeter gun was shot off. It was just like a howitzer now. It had a short barrel on it. One after the other was brought down by the 88. Either get out of there or get shot up. So you had to move, you wouldn't be stationary. Thank you, Mary says, well, back it up, back it up. He said, let's get out of here. Let's get the hell out of here. Back it up, back it up, Bill, back it up. My feet were going like this, shaking on it. Well, he no sooner said to that, and bam. God help me get me out of here. <laughs> that was frightening. <laughs> Brought a lot of them down, so the rest of them turned around and disappeared. As the dust settles on the mountain pass at Faid, the lessons to be drawn are there for all to see. We thought we had the best equipment and everything, but we finally found out that we didn't. At that time, we just felt we were vastly superior to them in every respect. But it's a lesson that U.S. commanders refuse to learn. And just two weeks later, they will send their tanks down the pass once more. We just do our duty and follow orders. 
That, of course, was a feast for us. November 1942. Rommel's Panzer Army meets disaster at El Alamein. The Germans withdraw 2,500 kilometers west to Tunisia, only to be faced by an Allied force advancing across the mountains. The rookie Americans roll into an ambush at Faid Pass. The German panzers advance up the pass and take up new positions at Sidi Bouzid, where the Americans launch their Shermans in another reckless counterattack. We're aware that the odds are against us from past experience. We're aware of that. No question. We don't fail, we just do our duty and follow orders. The Americans started to attack us with huge formations, like they always did. That, of course, was a feast for us. In a show of force, the Shermans attack at full throttle and with all guns blazing in a classic V formation. They charge blindly down the pass, kicking up such an immense cloud of dust they can see nothing to either side of them including the two panzer divisions, which are lying in ambush. It's a textbook cavalry charge, but it's a textbook that was written before the war, and a tactic that is hopelessly out of date against the battle-hardened panzers. They didn't know there were two German tank companies hiding. They didn't know that, of course. You have to say that this was their excuse. We had discussed on the radio that we let the Americans approach as much as possible. I believe the first American tank had approached at a distance of 300 meters, and then the first shot was fired. And so began the Battle of Sidi Bouzid. There were so many that we didn't have time to discuss who is targeting which tank. The German Panzer IV is one of the most powerful tanks on the battlefield. At a range of two kilometers, its 75 millimeter long barreled gun can punch through a Sherman's armor plating. At a fraction of that distance, it will blow a Sherman tank to pieces. It was a gun with an unbelievable speed. Our shells would go on a thing like the trajectory. Well, the Germans went right straight through. Of thousand meter. At a range of 1,000 meters, you had to aim only about 10 centimeters higher. Other than that, you could just use it as it was, because it shot the shells at a very high speed. We managed to destroy one American tank after the other in front of us. But, of course, they fired as well. I wouldn't say we were blind firing. Some of it might have been, but uh, the majority of it, we tried to have a target in mind. I had to duck my head a couple of times, but they never hit us.
dann The American tanks that were following further behind saw what was happening and obviously didn't think they had a chance and tried to escape towards the north. We drove north as well to cut off the retreating Americans. And then there was a duel between the Sherman tanks, which lasted for just a matter of minutes. Everybody just shot until there was no tank left, until all of them had been destroyed. The last tank was maybe two kilometers away. And I was able to take down this one as well. In Sidi Bouzid, we took out at least 45 to 60 Shermans. Our casualties were zero. The Shermans had shot not a single tank of ours. And it was a scary scene to see all these burning tanks in a small area. Two times in two weeks, the inexperience of the Americans has been exposed, and more than a hundred tanks lost. With his enemy on the ropes, Rommel comes up with a daring new plan to drive a stake straight through the heart of the American position and eliminate them once and for all. Tunisia, February 1943. Tanks of the U.S. 1st Armored Division charge blindly down the pass at Sidi Bouzid. For the Americans, it's a disaster. For German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, it's an invitation to finish them off for good. The American command appeared to be getting jittery, and they were showing the lack of decision typical of men commanding for the first time in a difficult situation. Beginners lack the nerve. I wanted to push forward with all our strength and strike on deep into the Allied rear. Rommel's plan, codenamed Operation Stormtide, is a three-pronged panzer onslaught through the mountain passes. And at the epicenter of the battle is a name that will become infamous in the annals of American armored warfare. Kasserine. These are the hills of tanks. My name is Ali Ammar, and I remember the war. Here in this place, there are a lot of dead bodies. This is my land, and every year we find bodies. The Germans were over there, and the Americans were there. This land is where the battle took place. This mountain was the most important place during the battle. February 1943. It's a battle the Americans are not prepared for. Their defenses around Kasserine are overstretched and thinly deployed. 
Their heavy armor is poorly dug in on the rocky terrain and C Company of the 805th Tank Destroyer Battalion holds the high ground to the north. We was holding the pass. You might say we wasn't scared because up until that time, we really hadn't had too much conflict while up in that area, it was pretty quiet. But we never knew when something would happen. At first light, the German panzers make their move and Rommel himself is at the front, spearheading the attack. It was a short and precise order. Follow me, and further orders will follow later. Short and sweet. Of course, I said, yes, Field Marshal, sir. They were so close, I'll never forget that. As far as the naked eye could see to the right or left, bumper to bumper. We thought, oh my God, what's going to happen to our boys? They looked at us with surprise, because they didn't expect to see Germans here at all. It was an unusually rapid advance, for sure. When we saw them, I'll tell you, put the fear in you right off the bat. It was my task to scout the area with my binoculars from the turret for enemies inside. Then I told my gunner, turret at 12.30. And then to my loader, load the armor-piercing shell. Range 500 meters, tank at 12.30, fire at will. Automatically, the charging gunner would reload with another shell. This was all a matter of a couple of seconds. Oh, my. Uh, it made us all open our eyes and wonder what was going to happen next. American tank at 2 o'clock. Armor piercing. Fire at will. We saw a darting flame. He had hit the tank, and it was burning right away. On the left side, we suddenly saw eight American Sherman tanks. Right away, we took position. Although they were shooting as well, they didn't hit us. We shot better. You're scared, but you're only thinking of one thing, is survival. So we had several of the guns set up and start shooting down the Germans. The M3 half-track, equipped with a rear-mounted 75-millimeter cannon, is designed as a tank destroyer. Lightly protected, with just 16 millimeters of rolled face-hardened steel, its only means of defense is to attack. Seventy-five would hit the German tanks, and it was almost like, like taking a match and striking it. Seventy-five would hit their armor, and it would just ricochet right off. It couldn't penetrate. You just had to hope you're doing the right thing and doing it as fast as you can. Outgunned and outnumbered, C Company is cornered with its back to the mountain. The tank destroyers are about to become the destroyed. The enemy was real close to us. We was all wondering what to do next. All we could see is that steep mountain. We were more or less trapped.
February 1943, the Battle of Kasseri. A German tank inferno rages through the mountain pass, and the American defenses are consumed by fire. When we saw them, I'll tell you, put the fear in you right off the bat. American tank at two o'clock. Armor piercing. Fire at will. Let's all open our eyes and wonder what was going to happen next. C Company of the 805th U.S. Tank Destroyer Battalion is trapped, caught between the mountain and Rommel's unstoppable panzers. The enemy was real close to us. We were more or less trapped. And all of a sudden, planes came over, and we thought, oh my gosh, this now we're really going to be in it. We thought that was the end. Thinking it was German planes. It was going to be Custer's last stand. And all of a sudden, we realized they were Americans. That they started to strafe the Germans. And they swung up over us. And when they did, they had their wings rocked back and forth and followed one another over the top of this mountain. Somebody said, but they're trying to show us that we can get up over that and get down the, over to the other side. There's a pass up there, so we just follow that, and we can get out of this position. So then we immediately started, everybody going, get over the hill. You could see it looked impossible, but some of us made it, some didn't. Over the next three days, the Americans retreat over 100 kilometers. With more than 6,000 casualties and the loss of more than 200 of their armored vehicles, it's another defeat for the inexperienced and overconfident Americans. Our commanding officers were not knowledgeable. They didn't have the experience either that uh, was required uh, against uh, superior forces. But despite the victory at Kasserine Pass, Rommel's position is still perilous. His enemies are on all sides. With the Americans reeling to the west, he turns his attention to the British Eighth Army in the east. And on March 6th, he spearheads another shock attack, this time through the desert at Medanin. We drove from the pass through the desert at high speed, creating a huge dust cloud behind us so that you couldn't see anything behind us. About 150 tanks were supposed to push the British 8th Army back towards the sea and destroy them. But Rommel's luck has run out. British intelligence intercepts his orders, and 500 guns are waiting for him. Non-stop shells hitting in the front, the back, to the left, to the right. Next to me, approximately 15 meters away, there was a sergeant with his tank, and he got a direct hit in the turret. Right away, I saw flames coming out of the turret, and him sitting up, trying to jump out, but then collapsing. In front of me was company commander von Schlieffen, and he got a direct hit as well. Blinded by the sand, the German panzers are sitting ducks, unable to engage the enemy because they have no idea where the enemy is. In these four hours, all I could see was sand, 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 
spraying on all sides. You couldn't see to the left, nor right, nor front. You couldn't see anything at all. Just sand spraying around that blocked the view entirely. We were standing there. It didn't make sense to go anywhere. I was standing on the same spot for four hours and always hoping not to get hit by a shell. And Rommel's tank got hit as well. It had begun all of a sudden and it stopped all of a sudden at 12 p.m. As we figured later, 55 of the 150 tanks, one third, had been destroyed. It was a disaster for Rommel. This was Rommel's last battle in Africa. Three days later, Rommel is secretly recalled by Hitler to Germany for medical treatment, leaving the Germans bereft of their inspirational leader just when they need him most. Defeated by the British in the desert, their only escape route lies through the mountain passes to the west. But the US forces have regrouped. In Rommel's absence, they've reoccupied the Kasserine Pass. And now they have a new leader, brash and outspoken, General George Patton has taken charge, and where he leads, he expects his men to follow. He told us, which made us kind of laugh, we as men from Mars have no fear of anything. You're in good hands, and you'll come out of this on top. A confident boast by a confident general, whose mettle is about to be tested in the crucible of battle. February 1943. The Allied and German tankers fight for supremacy in the killing zone of Tunisia. Humiliated by one defeat after another, the Americans are put under the command of General George Patton. His task? transform an army that retreats into one that will stand up and fight. Patton would be right there hollering, go get them sons of bees, you know. We felt if we had a man that had that much guts, well, we had better have some nerve too. So that gave us a lot more confidence in ourselves, knowing that he depended on us. A reinvigorated American force reoccupies the mountain passes tightening the noose around the German panzers and blocking their escape route at El Gatar. Here, Patton draws a line in the sand, beyond which the Americans will retreat no more. Learning the grim lessons of Faid and Sidi Bouzid, Patton sets his own trap and his troops dig themselves in to the hard and rocky ground along either side of the pass. This one is a left over from a gun. You can find these all over the land. 
This one is also a leftover from a weapon. This is my land. I was 10 years old and I remember it all. The Germans came up the pass. The Americans were in the mountains. I remember the voice of the planes, the weapons. This is the land of war. March 23, 1943. The Germans advance up the pass at El Gatar, and this time, Patton's tank destroyers are ready for them. We had 36 of them guarding that pass. Our recon went out and bumped into the Germans. I counted 75 German tanks coming at us across the desert. They were moving real slow. They knew we were there. They were in no hurry and kept coming. It looked like they were on a parade ground. It's a calculated gamble by the Germans. The Panzers are an iron fortress moving at just five kilometers per hour down the middle of the pass. Their plan is to use their heavy armor like a blunt instrument to bludgeon straight past the American lines on either side. As long as we were below the top of the ridge, we couldn't shoot. So you'd pull up, shoot, and back down. Pull up, shoot, and back down. Wasn't any problem knowing where the targets were. They were out there. When you're on higher ground shooting down, it's a, it's a big advantage over somebody shooting up at you. I'd pull up as quick as I could and stop. And by the time I stopped, the gunner had his target and fired. The only place that you could do them any damage was hit within the tracks. If you could hit in there, you disabled them so they couldn't maneuver. I remember the fish. When you're in combat, first of all, you don't think about the possibility of being killed. You need to focus on achieving the target. Under withering fire, the German formation holds firm. Resolute and relentless, it inches towards its goal. I'm not being arrogant, but let's face it, we were valiant. We were an elite troop, weren't we? March 23, 1943. In the decisive battle of the North African campaign, the German panzers advance up the pass at El Guitar. But for the first time in the campaign, the U.S. force refuses to give an inch. And over 12 torrid hours, they slug it out with the Germans. Either going to be them or us, one or the other. You 
just got to uh, hope you're doing the right thing and uh, doing it as fast as you can. Kind of hard on the driver. He's sitting up not too far from the end of that barrel. So that's why I don't hear too well now. <laughs> We were terribly frightened. Every soldier would have this nervous feeling in his guts and would shit his pants. One of the things you had to admire about the German soldier was we knock out a tank and the crewmen, if they weren't hurt, they would take their machine gun off the tank and ground around it and lay there and keep shooting. Twice in the course of the day, the Panzers advance up the pass. And twice, the tank destroyers of the 805th Battalion hold firm. The losses on both sides are immense. By day's end, 21 tank destroyers and 31 panzers lie burning across the plain. But the battlefield belongs to Patton, and the exhausted panzer force now has nowhere left to turn. And, uh, and that was the end. After we had run out of ammunition and gas, there was nothing else to do but give up. And that happened on May 13, 1943. More than a quarter of a million German troops in Tunisia surrender to the Allied forces. The feeling was horror about being captured, of course. There's nothing worse that can happen to a soldier. Until today, we are still proud to have been part of the Africa Corps. El Guitar is the Americans' first armored victory of the war. No more will their battle-scarred tankers be seen as the Allies' weakest link. But that success has come at a price. No, I didn't think it would be a breeze. <laughs> you know, actual combat is never a breeze. either going to be them or us, one or the other, so uh, you get scared. I would say you, you can't help it if you've got anything about you, it's human. It's part of, I think, warfare that you've got to accept the fact that uh, you're going to have casualties that some of your best friends might not survive. The Battle of Tunisia is the closing chapter in the story of Rommel's Africa Corps. But for Patton and his battle-hardened tankers, it is the beginning of a journey that will ultimately lead to victory in Europe.